Okay, so, uh, welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing ATP binding cassette transporters, okay, also called ABC transporters. Okay, so we've seen now uh, the 49 uh, different ABC transporters and how they're categorized into these different families. Okay, so we've seen their names, we haven't really looked at them in any detail. We've looked at examples, important examples, which have been heavily studied because of their involvement Involvement in human pathology, such as the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator ABCC7, and then also ABCB1 and ABCC1, which are involved in uh, drug resistant cancer cells. Okay, right. So let's now talk about the structure of ABC transporters, and then we'll talk about how they actually uh, move uh, solute up the electrochemical gradient, either into the cell or out of the cell. Okay, and for that we will uh, look specifically at the multi-drug resistance protein 1, the MDR1, also called P-glycoprotein or ABCB1, uh, because that one's been heavily studied and that one actually has uh, an okay mechanism that's been elaborated, okay, whereas the others and their mechanism just isn't known, fairly little is known about most of them. Okay, right, so let's start with the structure then of an ABC transporter. Okay, so firstly we need to distinguish between full ABC transporters and half ABC transporters. So I've given you this great long list of 49 different ABC transporters. Some of them will be full transporters, i.e. the protein which those genes make will look like what I'm about to show you now. Okay, so I'll draw you out a full transporter and then I'll show you a half transporter. Okay, right. So, if the ABC uh, gene uh, is a full transporter, the protein will look like so. Here's the amino terminus. Then you have this cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, which are all together like so. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And this first cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, which are all together, is known as transmembrane domain one, or TMD1. Okay, so the T is for trans, the M is for membrane, and then the D is for domain. So this is transmembrane domain one. Okay, then uh, you have a loop between transmembrane domain one, sixth membrane spanning alpha helix, and the first membrane spanning alpha helix of transmembrane domain two. Okay, and in this loop, you have a special domain known as the nucleotide binding domain one. Okay, so this is NBD1 or it's also called the ATP binding cassette. So this is important because this is after the, well, this is the domain after which the entire thing is named. So NBD1 stands for nucleotide binding domain 1. Okay. However, this same domain can also be called the ATP binding cassette. Okay, and it's the ATP binding cassette 1, because there is also going to be the ATP binding cassette 2, or the nucleotide binding domain 2. Okay, so we could also call this ABC domain 1. Okay, so let's colour this in in blue. So here is the nucleotide binding domain 1. Right. After nucleotide binding domain 1, you then have another cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, which are all together like so. So here is a cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, and that cluster is known as transmembrane domain 2. Okay, so we have a second transmembrane domain here. And then, in the cytoplasmic portion after the sixth membrane-spanning alpha helice of transmembrane domain 2, we then have another nucleotide binding domain down here before we then go into the carboxylic acid terminus of the protein. And this second nucleotide binding domain, which has now been coloured in in pink here, that's known as the nucleotide binding domain 2 or the MBD2, or you could also call it the ATP binding cassette 2, the ABC2. Okay, right, so this is what a full transporter looks like. Now, some of those 
49 genes that I've told you about will code for full transporters that look like this. Others will code for half transporters. Okay, so let me now tell you about what a half transporter looks like. And what you'll notice is that really there is two repeated structures here. There's a transmembrane domain 1 with nucleotide binding domain 1. Okay, so I'll colour this in, in orange. I'll circle it rather in orange. Okay, so this portion that I've now circled in 1 is one portion. And then this second portion that I'm now circling in orange again over here, that's uh, a repeat basically of what we've just seen here. Okay, right. So now let's talk about half transporters. And a half transporter is basically just going to be a half of this, one of these. Okay, so half transporters will only have a single transmembrane domain. Okay, and then only a single uh, mem sorry, only a single nucleotide binding domain as well. Okay, so here is the transmembrane domain with six membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. And then, of course, you will have your nucleotide binding domain down here. Okay, and then you'll have your carboxylic acid terminus of your polypeptide here. So in turquoise, this is the nucleotide binding domain this time. Right, okay, so, um, basically, a full transporter works on its own. This is enough to make a transporter which can transport uh, solute molecules across the cell membrane. So this is functional on its own. Half transporters are not. They have to buddy up with another half transporter to make effectively the full thing. Okay, So these ones have to dimerize, basically. And what's interesting is that they can either dimerize uh, with an exact replica of themselves, Okay, and that would be called a homodimer. So if they use an exact replica of themselves, i.e. the ABC um, protein that they pair up with is produced by the same gene as themselves, okay, they'll then be called a homodimer. If, however, they use a different um, half transporter, okay, so they find a half transporter that's actually coded by one of the other 48 genes, okay, or no, it will be less than that because some of those will be full transporters, okay, so however many half transporters there are. Uh, if it finds one that's encoded by a different gene, uh, then that will be called a heterodimer. Okay, so you do find heterodimers, basically. They can't, don't just homodimerize. Okay, right. So, uh, that's the difference between full transporters and half transporters. And um, most of them are actually full transporters themselves. For instance, the entire ABCA family are full transporters. Most of the ABCB family are full transporters. So there are a lot of full transporters, basically. But some of them are half transporters. And those can either homodimerize or heterodimerize, okay, to form a functional transporter. Okay, right. So, now I want to discuss with you the mechanism by which uh, we actually get the movement of the solute across the membrane. So how do these transporters actually perform active transport? And for this, what we will use is the multi-drug resistance uh, protein 1. Okay, so MDR1. And I think I'll just get another piece of paper for this because we won't really have room to put it just in that bottom bit and I'd like it all to be on the same page. Okay, right. So, this is um, a mechanism that is quite new, okay, and I couldn't find it in the textbook, so I got it from a review, so I'm going to give you the reference for that review now. Everything we've discussed up to now has been textbook stuff, okay, but this is more uh, recent, so I'll give you a review. So, Linton 2007 is my reference. That's where I got the information for this um, mechanism from. Okay, right. So, we are using ABCB1, okay, uh, which is a half transporter, okay, so it only makes up half of the full transporter, so it has to dimerize. Now, let's talk about the homodimer, okay, where it's dimerized with an exact replica of itself.
Okay, and this protein is also called MDR1, which stands for multi drug resistance protein 1, or indeed it's also called P glycoprotein, and for short, glycoprotein is often just abbreviated to lowercase g, lowercase p, like that. So PGP stands for P glycoprotein. Those are all names for the same thing. And at the moment, it's going to be homodimerized together, so you're going to have taken two of these structures here, dimerize them together to make the full uh, transporter. Okay, right, so now we want to talk about how it's going to transport uh, molecules across the cell membrane. And remember, this is the, mo well, this is the transporter that uh, was involved in drug resistance within uh, liver, kidney, and colon cancer, okay? So overexpression of this caused drug resistance in those cancer cells. And the reason for that was that it, it um, exported those drug molecules such as vinblastine and doxorubicin out of the cell. Okay, so we want to see how does this uh, transporter actually transport uh, these uh, drug molecules out of the cell. Okay, so let's start by drawing a little cartoon of it then. Okay, so here is the cell membrane then. And the channel is going to begin in the inwardly facing state. Okay, so it's going to start off facing the interior. Okay, so I'll draw that like so. So here's one of these um, ABCB1 proteins. And remember, it's a dimer, so I'll draw another one here. Okay, so here is the second ABCB1 protein. Okay, and the dimerize together, and the whole transporter is sitting in the cell membrane like so. So I'll color these in in blue. Okay, and at the moment it's inwardly facing, so it's going to bind the ligand from the cytoplasm basically. Okay, so here it is in blue. Now, I've missed off one of the key domains at the moment, which is the nucleotide binding domain. So I'm now going to have the nucleotide binding domain dangling down from up here. Okay, and now I'll tell you a little bit more about the nucleotide binding domain. The nucleotide binding domain actually has a binding site for two ATP molecules. So it has two binding sites and therefore can bind to two separate ATP molecules. Okay, uh, and then of course this uh, ABCB1 will also have uh, a nucleotide binding domain here, like so. Okay, so I'll color in these uh, nuclear bi nucleotide binding domains in turquoise here, and of course they can also be called ATP binding cassettes if you wish. Okay, right, so this is the structure of the uh, transporter initially, okay, so it's in the inwardly facing state, okay, so it's inwardly facing. Okay, right, what's now going to happen is the substrate, okay, which we want to move out of the cell, okay, and MDR1 is going to be an exporter, it's going to move things out of the cell. Okay, so uh, the substrate molecule, which we can imagine is potentially vinblastine, okay, is going to come and bind here, and it's going to now be transported out of the cell. So here is our substrate, or our um, solute. Okay, and I'll colour in the solute in red. So it's going to come and bind to this binding site here. And when it binds, what it will trigger is it will trigger uh, the nucleotide binding domains to change conformation, and they will now gain affinity for ATP molecules. So let me now show ATP molecules. Okay, so this is an ATP molecule here, represented as this egg-like shape with ATP written in. Okay, so this is just a simple diagram to represent ATP. Okay, so we'll colour in the ATP in green down here. Okay, so this is ATP here. And basically what's going to happen is the nucleotide binding domains are going to bind two molecules of ATP, and the molecules of ATP will sit in between the nucleotide binding domains. Okay, so what's going to happen is when the nucleotide binding domains bind the ATP, then they're going to dimerize at the same time. So let me show this. Okay, so here is the membrane again. 
Okay, we're still in the inwardly facing state, and I'll just move this out a little bit. Okay, so we're still facing inwards. We have the ligand binding domain facing inwards. Okay, like so. And we've got our ligand bound, so we're imagining this is our vinblastine molecule facing inwards there. So here's the ligand molecule in red, and here is the rest of the membrane here. And in blue we have the transmembrane domains, which remember consist of these six membranes spanning alpha helices. And now what we have is the nucleotide binding domains have dimerized together. So I'll draw them as one confluent portion now, like so. And what's caused this dimerization? Well, they have bound to the ATP molecules. And basically, it was the ligand binding that then changed the conformation of the nucleotide binding domains so that they could bind to ATP in the first place. OK, so we'll have the nucleotide binding domain in turquoise here. And I think I'll change to colouring in the ATP in orange rather than in green, because the green won't be distinguishable from the turquoise. OK, so in orange here, this is the ATP. OK, so we have the two molecules of ATP now bound uh, by the two nucleotide binding domains, which have uh, joined together. What will now happen is you'll get a conformational change in the transmembrane domain. Okay, so when the nucleotide binding domains bind to ATP and dimerize like this, it triggers a conformational change in the transmembrane domains, which then results in this going from being in the inwardly facing state to being in the outwardly facing state. Okay, so let's draw this here. So this is the outwardly facing state of the channel then, or of the transporter rather. OK, so it now faces outward like so. And it's still sitting in the membrane. And of course, once it then starts facing outwards, what's going to happen is the ligand is going to be released, basically. But we'll draw the ligand still bound for the time being. OK, so it's just changed conformation, and the ligand hasn't had actually time yet to move out of that binding site there. OK, and down in the cytoplasm, the nucleotide binding domains are still dimerized together with these two ATP molecules suspended between them. OK, like so. So here's an ATP molecule, and here is another ATP molecule. OK, so in orange, here are the ATP molecules, and in turquoise, here are the nucleotide binding domains. OK, right. So what happens next then? So it's now changed conformation, and it's in the outwardly facing state. OK, what will then happen is the drug molecule or whatever other substrate it could be. And I should stress that we discussed these 49 different ABC transporters. We know that they will all have different substrates which they will move, but also each of these ABC transporters on its own has a whole plethora of different substrates that can actually move. So there may be many different things that can bind here and then be transported onto the outside. OK, so um, solute leaves. OK, so the solute loses its affinity for binding to uh, the transmembrane domains of the ABCB1 uh, transporter and uh, will leave. OK, and then when the solute leaves, this triggers the ATP hydrolysis within these nucleotide binding domains. So what will now happen is ATP is going to be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate, and this will release energy. OK, so let me just discuss with you in a bit more detail what I mean by the hydrolysis of ATP, just to remind you if you might have forgotten. OK, so let's start with what ATP actually stands for. So it stands for adenosine triphosphate. OK, so let me draw a little cartoon for this. So basically, uh, adenosine is the name for adenine bound to ribose. OK, so this is my cartoon for a ribose sugar here, which I'm going to cover in blue. 
Okay, so ribose is a five-membered ring where four of the members of the ring are carbons. Okay, and the top member is an oxygen. And then you have a fifth carbon coming off the side, like so. Now, uh, when you bind ribose to the organic base adenine, which I'll just draw as a rectangle with an A written in it, and that creates you what is known as adenosine. Okay, so this combination of adenine plus ribose, together that is called adenosine. Okay, and basically to convert adenosine into adenosine triphosphate, all you have to do is stick three phosphate groups coming off the uh, fifth carbon of the ribose, like so. Okay, so these phosphate groups here in pink, these are um, the free phosphate groups of adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so that's what how the name relates to its actual structure. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to chop that final phosphate group off the ATP molecule. And I should just say that the phosphates of ATP are named the alpha phosphate, the beta phosphate, and then the gamma phosphate. So we are going to chop the bond between the beta phosphate and the gamma phosphate. And what we will then create is adenosine diphosphate, which is just adenosine. Whoops, not like that. I'll have to rectify this by drawing it a little bit weirdly. OK, so that's the fifth carbon of the ribose down there. And then we've got our ribose with our adenine bound to it. OK, so in green, this is the adenine here. Then we've got our ribose, which will be in blue here. OK. And then we've got our phosphate, which will be in purple here. And this is adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. And then the other product will be that single gamma phosphate on its own, which is then just called an inorganic phosphate. OK. And that's often denoted as PI. So the P is for phosphate, the I is for inorganic. Okay, so this is what is meant by ATP hydrolysis. The ATP is going to split into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Now, there is a lot of energy stored in that bond between the gamma phosphate and the beta phosphate. So when you break that bond, what's going to happen is you're going to release a lot of energy. Okay, so what's going to happen is these two ATP molecules are going to hydrolyze. They're going to break into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And of course, this is a much simpler picture of ATP than this. Okay, but when the ATP is split into ADP and inorganic phosphate, those ADP and inorganic phosphate molecules fall off the nucleotide binding domains. Okay, and then the two nucleotide binding domains uh, are no longer dimerized, basically. Okay, so let me draw this. So, at the moment, we're still in the outwardly facing uh, state, okay? So the transmembrane domains still have their ligand binding domain facing the outside of the cell, like so. Okay, and uh, now what has just happened is these ATP molecules have been hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate, and the result of that is that the two nucleotide binding domains have lost those ADP, well, they've lost those ATP molecules, okay? So the ADP no longer binds to the nucleotide binding domains, and it's gone off into the cytoplasm. And remember, the ATP was all that was holding the two nucleotide binding domains together, so those have split apart. Okay, so in turquoise here, these are the nucleotide binding domains, which are now no longer attached together. Here we have the transmembrane domains in blue, which are currently in the outwardly facing state. Okay, like so. Uh, and with no ligand bound anymore. Remember, the ligand has long since detached. Okay, and uh, the ATP has split into ADP and then an inorganic phosphate, which I'll draw in my simpler picture like so. Okay, so the egg shape cut into two pieces like so can represent our phosphate group in purple here. And then our ADP can be in yellow here. Okay, right. So we've got two molecules of ADP here. So these two in yellow here, these are the two ADP molecules. 
and then we've got our phos inorganic phosphate groups here, and again we've got two of those. Right, okay, now what will happen is once the nucleotide binding domains cleave apart, okay, so they're no longer dimerized, then that triggers the transmembrane domains to change conformation again, and they will change back into the inwardly facing conformation. Okay, so they'll go back into this inwardly facing state where the two nucleotide binding domains are once again undimerized. They don't have ATP bound to them. And now we're back to the beginning, basically, because now what can happen is another ligand molecule can come and bind in this uh, ligand binding domain that is now facing the intracellular uh, cytoplasm, okay? And you can begin the whole cycle again. Okay, so basically if we analyze the whole maneuver, what has happened is we have moved a single solute molecule across the cell membrane. Specifically, we've moved it out. We've exported it. And the price that we paid for that is we had to hydrolyze two molecules of ATP. And that's the general stoichiometry of all ATP binding cassette transporters. Okay, it's two molecules of ATP that will be hydrolyzed for a single solute molecule being transported across the membrane. Okay, right, so that now concludes our discussion of the ABC transporters. So we've seen the structure of the things, we've seen that they can be full transporters or half transporters, and we've seen this example of a mechanism of an ABC transporter. Specifically, we've looked at uh, ABCB1, which is also known as the multi-drug resistance protein 1, or P-glycoprotein, which is a half transporter and dimerizes together, and when it does that, it can transport things out of cells and it's important on the blood-brain barrier in health uh, and uh, in disease it can also be responsible for drug resistance within uh, colon cancer, kidney cancer and also uh, liver cancer. Okay, right, so that's it.